Stop me if you've heard this before. The owner doesn't want to bring in big money free agents. He lets his best players leave or trades them because he's reluctant to pay competitive salaries. The team's total payroll is consistently in the bottom half compared to the other major league teams. If you thought I was talking about Carl Polad, you're wrong. The Twins had that reputation long before he bought the team. So let's go back to the beginning. The Washington Senators played their first game in the American League versus the Philadelphia Athletics on April 26, 1901. In 1919, former player and manager Clark Griffith purchased a controlling interest in the team and was named president. Ironically enough, one of the reasons he bought the team was that he was frustrated with the previous owner's penny pinching. The Senators played at National Park, which was renamed Griffith Stadium after Clark bought the team. They won a World Series in 1924. Griffith was elected to the Hall of Fame as an executive in 1946 and owned the team until he died in 1955. When he died, ownership was transferred to his nephew, Calvin. In August 1960, the American League voted to expand, and in October, the Twin Cities was granted an expansion team. Calvin made a deal with league officials where he could move his team to Minnesota and Washington would receive the expansion team instead. And in November 1960, the team was officially renamed the Minnesota Twins. The Twins played their first game on April 11, 1961, beating the Yankees 6 0 in New York. They played their first home game on April 21st at Metropolitan Stadium, losing to the expansion Senators 5 3. The first 10 years were fairly successful. They played in the World Series in 1965, losing to the Dodgers and were in the American League Championship Series in 69 and 70, losing to the Orioles both times. Despite that early success, Griffith was notoriously tight-fisted as an owner. Mudcat Grant once said that Griffith was so cheap, he threw nickels around like they were manhole covers. In 1970, Kurt Flood filed a lawsuit against Major League Baseball to open the door for free agency. Griffith hated free agency and was very much opposed to it. He refused to pay competitive salaries to keep his players. He either let them sign elsewhere or traded them. He believed baseball was a business, and he would make his decisions based on that. In 1977, Rod Carew won the batting title and the American League MVP, all while making less than other stars around the league. Carew was frustrated with Griffith's penny-pinching ways. He also saw his teammates leaving and getting big paychecks to play elsewhere. Carew made $200,000 in 1977. He was willing to extend his contract if the salary was competitive and if Griffith made an effort to improve the team. Even though Carew wanted around $700,000, Calvin originally offered $250,000 because he said he couldn't afford it. Carew was upset and said he would never sign with the Twins again. Then in September 1978, Griffith made some racist remarks in a speech in Wasika which made Carew even more upset. So eventually Calvin traded him to the Angels. Carew re-signed with the Angels for $800,000 for the 1979 season. In 1982, there were rumors that Griffith was looking to sell the team. He traded five veteran players at the beginning of the season in cost-cutting moves, four of them within 48 hours. fans were not happy about it. That season the team lost 102 games, which would stand as the Twins' worst record ever until 2016. But because of those losses, they earned the number one draft pick the following year. With that pick, they selected a pitcher named Tim Belcher. He wanted a minimum of $125,000 for a bonus or he wouldn't sign. For reference, the number two pick, Kurt Stillwell, got $140,000 for a signing bonus. Calvin refused to pay a bonus that high, so Belcher refused to sign and was drafted by the Yankees in the secondary phase. Other owners were baffled by Calvin's behavior. Most believed he could have signed Belcher and then traded him for $200,000. When he was asked about losing Belcher, Griffith said it's not the first time we've lost something. The reporter responded, but it's the first time you've had the number one pick. Calvin said, and I hope we never have it again. As excited as fans were when Griffith finally sold the team in 1984, that frugal philosophy didn't change much. 
Under Carl Polad's ownership, they won the World Series in 1987 and 1991, but both of those championships were done on a relative budget. The 87 team was in the bottom half of the league in salary, and the 91 team was in the middle of the pack. Following the 91 championship, Jack Morris signed with the Blue Jays. Many Twins fans were upset because they thought the Twins had a decent shot at repeating as champions the following year. Morris told the story about leaving the Twins on local radio. He said, I had lunch with Carl. He knew my value, and he told me, you're a businessman, you have to go to Toronto and get the money, because I'm saving mine for Kirby. The 92 team ended up finishing second in the division, and Toronto won the World Series. Before we go any further, we need to address some major events that affected the rest of the story. In August 1994, baseball players went on strike. Owners were trying to institute a salary cap because they claimed their profits were shrinking. The players were opposed to the salary cap. The World Series was canceled that year. But the following spring, players returned to work after a federal judge ruled against the owners, even though the financial issues still weren't resolved. Even though baseball was back, fans were very unforgiving. They were upset, and they let the league know with their attendance. On September 6, 1995, the minor league St. Paul Saints outdrew the Twins in attendance for the day. The players and owners finally agreed to a collective bargaining agreement in 1996, but instead of a salary cap, they agreed to a revenue sharing plan. The larger market teams would share a percentage of their profits with the smaller market teams. The smaller market teams were to use their shared profit in an effort to improve their performance on the field. Notice that doesn't specifically say anything about player salaries. In September 1995, Twins officials tell Legislative Task Force that the Metrodome is obsolete and can't generate the revenues they need to remain competitive in Major League Baseball. After the legislature denied public funding for a new baseball stadium, Major League Baseball gave Polad permission to sell the team in 1997. A month later, it's reported that Don Beaver, a nursing home mogul from North Carolina, approached the Twins officials about buying the team. In September, the Star Tribune reports that Polad has an offer from Don Beaver, but a day later he denies that report. Ten days later, Polad begins negotiations with Beaver and claims it's not a ploy to pressure Minnesota for a new stadium. In May of 1998, North Carolina citizens vote against the plan. On December 24th, it's reported that the Twins will be slashing their payroll from $27 million in 1998 to $10 to $15 million for the following season. So far, we've talked about the Lakers and the North Stars leaving, and the Timberwolves threatening to. This part isn't about being sold or moving. It's about the franchise being eliminated, as in gone, cease to exist. On December 18th, 2000, the Star Tribune quotes Carl Polat as saying he wants no part of contraction, and his objective is to keep baseball here. In October 2001, the first reports surface of contraction officially happening, before the 2002 season, with the Expos and Marlins named as possible candidates. A few days later, the Twins are rumored to be a candidate. On October 31st, Polad denies that he asked for a buyout from his fellow owners. November 6, the owners vote 28-2 in favor of eliminating two teams for the 2002 season. Just a few days later, Jim Polad sends a letter to Twins employees saying, Why should the Minnesota Twins not be contracted? We are unable to find a plausible answer. November 15th, in reference to the lack of progress on a new stadium, Commissioner Bud Selig tells Minnesotans they should look themselves in the mirror. The next day, a Minnesota judge grants an injunction filed by the Metropolitan Sports Commission to force the Twins to play in 2002. The Twins and Major League Baseball appeal. On November 24th, Alabama businessman Donald Watkins says he wants to buy the Twins. January 9th, 2002. It's reported that Polad loaned Sea League and the Brewers $3 million in 1995, which is a violation of Major League Baseball rules. The next day, Major League Baseball gives Donald Watkins permission to make an offer to buy the Twins. But it's eventually discovered that he doesn't have the finances. January 17th, Jim Polad says his father has not volunteered for contraction, and Twins president Jerry Bell says he's tired of hearing that accusation. 
January 22nd, the Minnesota Court of Appeals upholds the injunction that forces the Twins to honor their lease. The Twins in Major League Baseball then file an appeal to the Minnesota Supreme Court. But on February 4th, the Minnesota Supreme Court refuses to hear that appeal. The following day, Bud Selig calls contraction off for 2002, but says it's still a possibility in the future. April 1st, 2002, the Twins open their season with a win over the Royals. A few weeks later, Judd Zulgad and Randy First report that the Twins may have volunteered for contraction as early as April of 2001. Remember, that's six months before the first reports of contraction even happening, and well before all the denials about volunteering. In what seems to be a giant middle finger to all those who tried to contract the team, the Twins win the division and advance to the postseason. And on the 6th of October, the Twins beat the Oakland A's in the division series and advance to the ALCS. On that very same day, during the post-game celebration, Carl Polad finally admits volunteering the team for contraction and says he doesn't feel guilty in the least. A week later, the Twins lose the American League Championship Series to Anaheim four games to one. For the next few years, different ideas were brought up for a new stadium, but the legislature never approved anything. In February 2006, a Hennepin County District Judge rules that Polad can sell or relocate the team after the 2006 season. Just three months later, the Minnesota Legislature approves funding for the ballpark bill. In May 2007, target field construction begins with an official groundbreaking ceremony held later that year. 2010 brought the inaugural season at Target Field, and the Twins beat the Red Sox 5-4 in the first game played there in April. Carl Polad didn't get to see that first game at Target Field. He died in 2009 at age 93. His estimated worth was $3.6 billion, which ranked him at number 102 on the Forbes 400 Richest Americans list. Remember when the Twins said they needed a new stadium to be competitive? The year the Target Field opened, the Twins were ranked 10th in the league in payroll. Here are the Twins' payroll ranks since then. Like it or not, that's the way Major League Baseball is structured. With revenue sharing in its present form, it essentially allows small market teams to make money without having to be competitive. Winning championships today is costly. It can be done on a budget, but it's not very likely. Since 1992, only five of the 26 World Series champions were from small markets. And even then, spending money is not a guarantee. Putting money into winning a championship is a financial risk. So it's safer for a team like the Twins to try to develop talent rather than buy it. Since that ALCS run in 2002, the Twins haven't fared very well in the postseason. They've made six appearances but gained a reputation for early exits at the hands of the big bad Yankees. Phil Cuzzy didn't help the situation either. Fly ball down the left field line, that ball slicing, and it is a foul ball. The tip of the glove in fair territory, and then lands fair. Wow. But I'm becoming convinced that most Twins fans aren't as upset about the championship drought as I am. And I say that out of love, because my dad is one of those people. He's one of the most unconditionally loyal Twins fans I know. When postseason talk comes up, his response is usually about the two championships and how often they've won the division. He also has an interesting way of looking at their success or lack thereof. All right, so tell me again about your, your theory about the probability of winning the World Series. Well, how many major league teams are there? There's 30. Okay, so the probability of winning the World Series is 1 in 30. Twins have won 2 in the last 31 years, which is way over average. So you, th you think they're doing better than expected because they've won 2 out of 31? Yes. And honestly, I think that's how a lot of Twins fans think. They're pretty proud of those championships. And even though the last one was 28 years ago, to my dad, waving his homer hanky still feels like yesterday. And who doesn't love a day at the ballpark, whether they win or lose? Don't ever say Minnesotans aren't loyal. So where does that leave us? They won the division this year and broke the team home run record. They weren't expected to be this good. This might be the best lineup the Twins have ever had. And because of that, many fans were critical when they didn't make a bigger move at the trade deadline to bolster the pitching staff. And guess who they're playing in the first round? Regardless of what happens in October, 
it'll be very telling what the Twins do in the offseason. Will they go after any big-name free agents, or will they keep working their farm system with all these prospects we keep hearing about? But by the time these prospects get called up, how many players from this year's roster will have moved on to other teams? It's just the way it seems to go around here. So when do you think the Twins will win their next championship? Do you think they'll ever win another one? In that World Series? Yeah. Somewhere in the next 30 years. <laughs> we better move on. I think my bilateral leg weakness is starting to flare up. Longer, longer than Everything's Soccer, baby. Soccer.